All right, Philippians chapter 3 once again. Philippians chapter number 3 again. We'll be over here uh, at least today and another week, Lord willing, at least. And then uh, we got chapter 4, and we'll be done with this little book of Philippians. Um, last week we looked at verses 4 through 9. Uh, basically the conversion of the Apostle Paul where he recounts all of his own goodness, if you will, his own righteousness according to the law, his own good works. He goes through all the things that he might could have claimed and that he used to put his trust in. And he said, hey, I threw all that away. I cast it all away just so that I could have the righteousness of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Uh, and that was the conversion story of the Apostle Paul. And that's all of our conversion story. If we would be truthful about it, we all gave up all hope in ourselves. We gave up all hope and confidence on our own good works. And we turned and put our faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul said, I did those things that I might win Christ. In verse number 8, he says, Yea, I doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord. Now he's going to build upon that expression in the passage we have today in verses 9 through 14. He's talking about the excellency of the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In these verses we have this morning, he's going to go more into knowing Christ, the knowledge of Christ. And that's what he's going to talk. So let's begin reading in verse number 9. He says, And if I be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says he wants to know Him. He wants to know the power of His resurrection. Uh, he wants to know the fellowship of his sufferings. He wants to know Christ more and more. You know, we can know people, and certainly at this point, Paul has been a follower of Jesus Christ. His conversion was many years before this, probably at least about 15 years, probably. You can't say that he didn't know the Lord, certainly know him. He's already written down many revelations about Jesus Christ that he had received as a, an apostle. Uh, certainly he had written down even some mysteries that the Old Testament saints were not, uh, had did not know. And you can read in the book of Ephesians some New Testament church truths that were unknown previously that Paul had revealed. And, you know, he knows about Christ and his miraculous birth and his death and his resurrection from the dead and his ascension to the right hand of God. And he talked about his coming again and he talks about him being uh, a, a exalted on the right hand of God and the power and the authority that he has and the dominion that he has. It's not that he didn't know anything about the Lord, but he just wants to know him more. Now the knowing here is not just knowing about things. You know, we might know things about somebody, but we don't really know that person. It's an experiential knowledge that Paul is talking about. He wants to experience yet more and more a deeper understanding of Christ. That's what Paul is longing for. That's what Paul is yearning for. Um, that's what this passage is dealing with. And, and I, I'll be honest with you, the, the, the passage we have today, especially at verse 10, uh, I, I believe there, there's depth of meaning and truth in this verse that, quite honestly, I don't feel adequate to. Uh, I, I'm just going to be clear and plain about that. I just feel inadequate to even discuss it because I feel like I'm in kindergarten, you know, honestly. And, you know, I, I, I brag, I don't know if brag's the right word, but I, I, I say on the YouTube channel, you know, I've been teaching and preaching the Bible for about 50 years. But when I come to some of these passages, I still feel like a first grader or a kindergartner, like I still just don't know much. Like I still have so far to go. And that's a little bit the attitude of the Apostle Paul here as well. And we're talking about an Apostle who's receiving revelation from God. Who has special gifts of apostleship. And certainly had met Christ face to face on the road to Damascus. And yet he says, I want to know him more. 
I want to know Him better. I want to know the, the real power of His resurrection in my life. I want to know the fellowship of His sufferings, He says. Brethren, I'm not adequate for these things. I'm just not. I'm going to tell you that right now. I'm going to probably stumble around here a little bit this morning. And there's probably a lot of things I'm not going to get said that need to be said or not say them adequately the way they ought to be said. But I just pray God will help me to do the best that I can. Paul says in the end of this passage we read this morning, he says, I count not myself to have apprehended. He said, I have not already attained. I've not yet been made perfect. I think that one of the main lessons I want us to gather this morning is this. Because most of us sitting here in this Sunday school class this morning have been converted for many years. My conversion was in 1970. That was a long time ago. I was a skinny kid with hair in those days. I know it's hard to picture, but that's what it was, Paul. I did, oh, that's what it was. And most of you here have been converted for many years. And, you know, sometimes when we've been saved for many years, and by the power of God and the grace of God, we have grown, hopefully, in Christ. We are not what we used to be. And sometimes we can get complacent and look back and say, oh man, look how far God's brought me. What our passage today is saying, we need to look ahead and see how far we still have to go. That's what Paul is saying here, I believe. I think that's the key truth. He said, I want to forget those things. We'll get to all this in due course. I'm kind of giving you an overview. He said, Paul, as Paul says, I want to forget those things that are behind. Yeah, God's brought me a long ways from being a persecutor to a saint. He said, but I've not yet attained that for which I was apprehended. Christ grabbed me and got a hold of me. And he says, I'm not going to reach the finish line yet. I'm still going. I'm still working at it. That's the passage we have before us today. You know, Peter said concerning the Apostle Paul, he said, in all his epistles, speaking in them things and some things which are hard to be understood. I think verse 10 in our passage today is one of those passages. Look at it again. Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. I, I think these are some of the deep things of God. Some of the hard things that Peter says Paul wrote. Things that, you know, just... Maybe we're not quite going to fully understand it today, and I'm not going to give a full enough explanation. Some of them may not be satisfied. I probably won't be satisfied with the explanation. I was looking at this last night till after midnight, again, going through my notes and looking up some more stuff and reading more commentaries and, and sermons and stuff, trying to, trying to get a better understanding of the passage in front of us. And I don't know that I accomplished that, but again, we need to not be complacent, I think is the attitude. Paul says, look, I want to know the power of Christ and His resurrection. You know, Romans chapter 1, verse 4 says, it is by the power of that resurrection that Christ is declared to be the Son of God by His resurrection from the dead. There's power there. I mean, you know, raising from the dead is not just some ordinary thing. We're talking about resurrection from death to life. Christ was dead, buried three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Which means he didn't die on Friday afternoon. But anyway, that's another Bible study. <laughs> All right, that's for another day. Because he was three days in the grave. And then life came back into that body and he walked out. And now he's seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Paul said, I want to know the power of that resurrection in my life. And again, the word know here is an experiential. I want to experience that power in my life. That's what I want, Paul says. I want to know that power. I want to understand it, not just intellectually, but I want to have it in my life. I want to feel that. And I'm not talking about a touchy-feely kind of feeling, but, a, but an experiential kind of feeling. I want to experience it. I want to know it, says the apostle. Romans 4.25 says, 
Christ was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. As 1 Corinthians 15 says, If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain and you are yet in your sins. You know, there's power in the resurrection of Christ. This is where the Jehovah's wickedness are totally off base because they do not have a resurrected Christ. That body never came out of the grave according to the Jehovah's Witnesses. They don't believe in a literal physical resurrection from the dead for Jesus Christ. He did not. He rose as a spirit being. Well, my first answer to that is you didn't put a spirit in the grave so a spirit doesn't come out of the grave. You put bodies in the grave and bodies come out of the grave. That's what resurrection means. That's the first answer I would give. Secondly, the Bible very plainly says he did physically, bodily raise from the dead and the same body that they hung on the cross and the same body they buried in a borrowed tomb is the same one that's now at the right hand of the Father. Amen. That's the same body of Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul says, I want to experience in my life the power of that resurrection. I want to understand that in my body. And, and you see the power of the resurrection because that's where, all, that's where our justification is. You see, in this passage we have before us, Paul is mingling in the justification, the sanctification, and the glorification. It's all in this passage. And Paul says, I want to experience this in my life. I, I want to understand these things in my life. First Peter, I did a, a YouTube short on this verse the other this past week. In 1 Peter 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Why do we have a living hope? Because we have a living Savior. <laughs> I mean, it's just that simple. If we don't have a living Savior, we don't have a living hope. In fact, we have no hope at all. Right. Our hope is vain. Our faith is dead. Our faith is in something that is dead if Christ did not raise. But because Christ raised from the dead, and by the way, the very next verse says, we have reserved for us in heaven an uncorruptible, undefiled inheritance that fadeth not away. We have a living hope because we have a living Savior. This is the power of the resurrection of Christ that Paul says, I want to experience in my life. I want to know more about it. I want to know it deeper and fuller, says Paul. Uh, Ephesians, just go back to Ephesians. Because Paul says, some, you know, if you read the epistles, that Paul wrote to the different churches and different individuals in the New Testament. You know, just like any of us, he's going to repeat himself to this person, to that person, to this group, to that group. So the same truths are found in most of the epistles, just worded differently. All right? In Ephesians chapter 1, listen to what he writes over here. In chapter 1, here he's not talking about himself desiring this deeper knowledge, but he's praying for the Ephesian believers. In chapter 1, look at verse 18. This is his prayer. And he says that the eyes, of verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. What is this mighty power? Well, Verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Paul says, I want this power for you people to understand it and experience in your life the mighty power of God that was demonstrated by the resurrection of Christ. He's saying the same thing over in Philippians, same thing in Ephesians. Now there's more here, but that's you know, the, the parallel that we have here that Paul is talking about. And here he's saying, this is part of my prayer for you saints. That you might, as he says, know the, the riches of the glory of the inheritance of the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us. Well, that was all demonstrated in the resurrection of Christ. He says, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 11, just going back a few pages further to the left in your Bible there. Uh, Romans chapter 8, you know, this is the same power that is going to give us our glorified bodies. <laughs> Romans 8, verse 11. If the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwelleth in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. The same power, the same Spirit of God that rose, that raised Jesus Christ from the dead one day is going to raise our bodies to be glorified. That's what chapter 8 is about. 
our glorified bodies. Paul says, I want to I want to experience that power. I want to experience that resurrection. You know, it's it's living a life constantly aware of the great power of God that works within us. That's what Paul is talking about. Not walking around defeated. God forbid that the child of God should walk around with a defeated attitude. We have the mighty power of God working in us. The same power that raised His Son from the dead is working in us. And Paul said, I want to experience this. I want to know this. I want to understand this more in my life. In my job, there are days that aren't as good as others. They don't go as well as others. I get, I get the bad loads. <laughs> the loads that I'm not going to be making money on. And sometimes I can let it get me down. Paul says, no, 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 no. Just forget about all that stuff. And think about the power of Christ. And the power of His resurrection in you. Take your eyes off of these things and let's just meditate on Christ and His power and His glory and the glory that's set before us that is guaranteed. We have a living hope because of the resurrection of Christ. By the way, just a sidebar here. The word hope. When you read the word hope in the Bible in the New Testament, it doesn't mean hope like we use the word in our modern language. We use the word hope today, we mean I wish. That's not what the hope means in the Bible. The word hope in the Bible is a confident, certain expectation. It only is using the word hope because it's future. We don't yet have it. But there's no uncertainty about any of the biblical hopes. They are certain. They are guaranteed by the resurrection of Christ. But the word hope is used because we don't yet have it. We don't yet possess it. It's still out in the future. For example, our glorified body. Today we're going to be free from temptation and sin. Well, I'm looking forward to that one. It gets me down. This struggle against sin. And I don't win as often as I should. One day, because I have a certain hope, that's going to be gone. That's the word hope. That's the hope we have because of the resurrection. Paul says, that power I want to know in my life. He says, but not only the power of the resurrection, but the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Now, I'm taking these two expressions together. All right? I think that being made conformable unto his death is just a further elaboration on the first part, being having uh, knowing the fellowship of his sufferings. Because the sufferings and death are all combined, all right? They go together. It called, the sufferings culminate in the death of Christ. Now, it's interesting here. He's putting the resurrection before the sufferings and the death. Well, because he's talking about justification, now he's talking about sanctification. Okay, that's why he's put them in this order. I want to know the power of the resurrection, but I also want to know the fellowship of his suffering and death. Because it's when we put ourselves in fellowship by faith with the sufferings and death of Christ that we're sanctified. When we're dead to the old man, dead to the old life because we died with Christ. He says, now the fellowship of his suffering also are bearing the cross that he might lay upon us. There's, I think, a double meaning here. And I'm not sure that's the important one in this particular passage, but it is a truth in the New Testament. You know, the sufferings of Christ are to be shared by the followers of Christ because following Christ in this world is not going to be popular. Following Christ in this world is not going to make you, you know, the life of the party for the worldly people. You're going to kind of be on the outside looking in. At least I hope so. <laughs> because you shouldn't fit in with the worldly crowd. They can like you. You can be a friend. But you shouldn't fit in with the world. That's right. We're to be different. We're to be a unique, peculiar people separated from the world. That's sharing in the sufferings of Christ. They hated Him, they're going to hate us. They persecuted Him, they're going to persecute us. That's what Christ taught us, isn't He? Yeah. 
But the main part of this passage that I want to emphasize is the sufferings of his Christ, of sufferings, fellowship of his sufferings of Christ and his being conformed to the image of his death, I think is the idea of the sanctification, identifying with his death and our dying with Christ and being raised to walk in newness of life. And that's the, that's the way I think I'm going to emphasize the passage because I think that's what Paul is getting to. He talks about the justification and the resurrection. Yes, the power of Christ there to deliver us from sin, deliver us from bondage. But there's also this idea of sanctification that comes in with the death. Uh, of course, Romans chapter 6. Let me just turn over here and read this passage. It's a familiar passage to most of us, I'm sure. Paul is using the example of baptism. And uh, he talks about baptism. And this is one of the passages in the Bible that we definitely can use to prove the fact that baptism in the Word of God means immersion underwater because it is a picture of death and burial and resurrection. And you can't picture death and burial and resurrection by sprinkling a few drops of water on somebody. It just doesn't work. The picture is ruined. All right? So if someone has not been baptized by being properly immersed under the water and raised back up to newness of life as the picture is if they have not been baptized that way they haven't been baptized at all they've just been gotten they've just gotten wet doesn't matter you can get we can get wet on you at the swimming pool you can get sweat and shot wet in the shower but that's not baptism <laughs> all right that's just something totally different but in Romans 6 he's talking about our baptism and then he says uh, verse 4 he says therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. That's the picture. Now, it's a picture, it's a twofold picture, baptism is. It's a picture of Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection for our salvation, but it's also a picture of our death, burial, and resurrection with Christ. It's a picture of our being dead and buried with him and raising to walk in newness of life. As he says, let's keep reading verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. There it is. That's sanctification, or the beginning of sanctification, if you will. The old man is crucified with Christ that the body of sin might be destroyed. In other words, the power of that body of sin, that it's control over us. That henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. You know, the guy laying in the coffin, temptation's done for him. He's done sinning. All his days of sinning are done because he's dead. Got a dead body doesn't get tempted to do anything, good, bad, or otherwise. It's dead. We died with Christ. The power that sin had over us is dead. Now, as Paul says here, and as he says in chapter 7, and as the New Testament teaches us, that old man is dead, but that old man still is struggling to take control. There's still that struggle. There's still that inward turmoil of the old and the new. And Paul says, oh... That some men, somebody would deliver me from this body of death. Well, he said, thanks be Christ Jesus has. Thank be to God. But that struggle's there. Paul said, that's why the things I would do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do do. Because we've got that old man still struggling. But by faith, we can reckon him to be dead with Christ. Because that's the picture of baptism. Let me keep reading here. Verse 8. If we be dead with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him, knowing that Christ, with being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, and in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, you reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. This is an act of faith. This is an act of the will. A daily, as Colossians chapter 3 says, putting to death, mortification, the deeds of the flesh. That's what he's talking about. Likewise ye, reckon, I reckon, consider it by faith in your mind, understand it to be so, that yourselves are be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, that ye should obey, its, in, obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of right, unrighteousness unto sin, 
but yield yourselves unto God as those who are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. This is the sanctification Paul is talking about in our text in Philippians chapter 3. Paul says, I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings and being conformed to the likeness of his death. I think it's the same truth. I think it's the same truth, just different words. Paul says, look, yes, power of the resurrection. We've been saved. We've been justified. We're right with God. We have a hope. But we still have this sanctification. We still have this, as he's going to say, becoming like Christ, getting to, getting to the goal. We still have the finish line ahead of us. Oh, we've been saved, yes. You know, here, let me, let me put it this way. Uh, and, and I'm going to read my notes. I don't like doing an extensive reading from my notes because I'm keeping my head down and then you see the top of my bald head. But, you know, it's, it's just part of the way it is. I, mean, you know, I hope the glare is not too much back there, Philip. But uh, let me just read it because I, I wrote this down pretty carefully. So let me just write this. You know, Paul is saying, we died with Christ. We were buried with Him. We rose with Him. We were dead to sin. We are alive to God and righteousness. Free from sin's power. Empowered by the resurrection of His life. That's what Paul is saying. There are other passages that he lists. Uh, that I, Let me just look at two more verses here. Galatians. Go to the book of Galatians. Paul talks about this several times in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 2. Verse 20. Familiar verse. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Also in Galatians, look over chapter 5, verse number 24. 5, 24. If we live in the Spirit, we... Oops, excuse me, that's 25. Verse 24. And that ye are Christ, have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Also in chapter 6. And I already quoted the verse in Colossians chapter 3 where Paul says, look, verse three, chapter 3, verse 5, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. He says there in verse 5, Mortify therefore, put these things to death. Reckon them, as he said in, Galatians, in Romans chapter 6, Reckon ye yourselves to be dead to sin in Christ. Be conformed to the image of His death. Fellowship in His sufferings and conform to the likeness of His death to the old man. Death to Christ. Death to sin. Dead with Christ to sin. To live unto God in righteousness. It's sanctification that Paul is talking about. It's sanctification here in the passage we have before us. Uh, Paul says, I want experientially to know the power of Christ's resurrection. I want experientially to be conformed more and more to the image of Christ and because of being conformed to the image of His death, he says. Verse 11, he goes on to say, If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. That's another interesting verse that's not understood perhaps by some. Additional motivation, you could say. Now, Paul is not saying he's uncertain about his coming resurrection from the dead. There's no uncertainty in Paul's mind. He says that I may attain unto it. But rather we find, as we do throughout the New Testament, that earnest struggle and warfare of faith that must persevere unto the end the perseverance of the saints. No one is truly converted who does not continue in the faith. That's a New Testament truth. Um, 1 Corinthians. Let me just read a couple passages here. 1 Corinthians. Because this is, I think, is what Paul's idea is in this passage, in this verse, verse 11. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 12. First Corinthians 10, verse 12. First Corinthians 10, verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand... Alright, let me start that verse again. Missed, cut, cut out. First Corinthians 10, verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest 
he fall. Paul says, I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to be conformed to the likeness and the image of his suffering and death. Why? So that I might attain unto that resurrection from the dead. I want to make sure I'm one of those that's part of the resurrection unto life. I want to make sure that my salvation is real. It's the idea of not being satisfied and saying, yeah, I know God saved me. I don't have to do anything. No. Um, Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Look over in Corinthians again, chapter 9, verse 25. Paul says, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the ear. He says, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. The idea is a self-watchfulness, a, 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 a just a continual watchfulness against the, the self and the flesh and the world, a continual watching that we're striving against sin, not content to say, well, yeah, I've already grown enough, I don't have to worry. No, take heed lest you fall. Take heed lest you fall, he says. He says, if by any means I might attain. Now, what's he really talking about? Attain a resurrection from the dead. Literally, the Greek word here is a resurrection out from the dead ones. That's literally what it means. It's literally what it says. Now, there are some people who I believe, and I'm sure Pastor agrees with me on this, they disagree, they, 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 they believe there's one general resurrection. Nope, not the case. There is a resurrection unto life, and there's a resurrection unto damnation. Paul says, I'm going to make sure I'm part of that resurrection unto life. That's what he's saying. I want to make sure I'm in that group. The resurrection out from among the dead. Now, let me just read a couple of verses on this to make sure we understand what we're talking about. In uh, he, Well, I'm not going to turn. Turn to Revelation chapter 20 because I do want to read these. Let me just quote you in Romans, no, excuse me, in Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, where Paul is talking about all these heroes of faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, he says, and they did that in order that they might obtain a better resurrection. A better resurrection. In other words, there's some resurrections that aren't going to be good. There's some resurrections that are going to be great. And those who lived by faith are going to have a better resurrection. Now, Revelation chapter 20 tells us plainly that these two resurrections that I believe the Bible plainly talks about are separated by a thousand years. All right, there's a thousand years separating these. In uh, Revelation chapter 20, uh, verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. We're talking about the godly, the believers, those who are trusting in Christ. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest, verse 5, of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Now the word first means there's another one. You don't use the word first if there's not something else afterwards. In John chapter 5, and this is where some people get confused. Let me just read the passage that some people want to interpret as a general resurrection. But even here, I don't believe that's what it says very clearly. But in John chapter 5, I want to read verses 28 and 29. Jesus said these words. He said, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves will hear His voice, meaning the voice of the Son of God, Christ Jesus. And they shall come forth, they that have done good under the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. Now, if that's the only verses we had in the whole Bible about resurrection, it might could be interpreted as one general res resurrection. And some go here and some go there. But we just read in Revelation chapter 20 that there is a first resurrection and there's another resurrection separated by a thousand years. 
So you clarify one part of scriptures with another part of scriptures. So you have a resurrection unto life, and then you have a resurrection unto damnation, the second resurrection. I, quite honestly, I think Psalm 1 actually fits into this as well. I'm just going to read it. Let me see if I can get there quickly. Psalm 1. Psalm number 1. Look what, he said. Look what the Bible says here in Psalm 1. It says, Therefore the ungodly, verse 5, The ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. The ungodly are not going to stand in the judgment of the righteous. They're not going to be in the same judgment. There's two resurrections and there's two different judgments. For the godly and the ungodly, the saved and the lost. The righteous and the unrighteous, the believers and the unbelievers. The converted and the unconverted. You can express it any way you want, but they're two separate resurrections. And Paul says, hey, I want to know the power of Christ's resurrection. Yes, that's justification. I also want to know about His sanctification. I want to be growing and becoming more like Christ. I want to know the power of His death and, and, and that in my life as well. And dead to the old man, living to the new man. He says, why? Because I want to make sure I'm part of that first resurrection, the resurrection out from the dead. The others are still going to be there for a thousand years. I want to make sure I'm part of that first resurrection. Or as Hebrews says, a better resurrection. That's what Paul is saying in verse 11. Let me go back over to my text in Philippians 3. Let me just read verses 12, 13, and 14. We'll come back to this passage and tie it in with the verses that follow, but just a few words as we, as we close here. Um, in uh, 12, 13, and 14, he says, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that by... That, excuse me, if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, hey, I haven't reached the finish line yet. Because you know what the finish line is? To be like Christ. Anybody get there yet? Don't even think about raising your hand, Brother Paul. <laughs> I know you wouldn't. Because we're not there yet. Paul says, I'm not reached that yet. I, look, he, he, the, the, the illustration he's used like the, like, the, like the Greek and Roman games they had. A guy in a race. Yeah, I, I've passed some people. I'm not where I used to be back at the starting line. I'm not still that old man. That old man is dead. But forget those things that are behind me. The goal is still up there. I haven't got to the finish line yet. I'm still running the race. And the way to do that is to know Christ. The power of His resurrection and to fellowship and be conformed to the likeness of His death. That's how we become more like Christ. That's how we run the race. I think that's the, I think that's the passage we have before us as best I can understand it. Which... Maybe right or not. You know, Paul, and I'm going to read this again from my notes because I took some time to, to write it out kind of specifically as I wanted it. Paul says, look, the Lord Jesus stopped me on the road to Damascus. He overpowered the strong man of sin that was in me. He claimed me as one of his own. He called me as one of those sheep for whom He had died, one that the Father had given to Him before the foundation of the world. He came and He overpowered me and He claimed me and took me for His own. He took possession of me by His Spirit. He took hold of me by His grace. And to what end? To make me holy and conform to His own very image. And Paul says, I haven't gotten to that goal yet. That's what I was apprehended for. That's what he got a hold of me for. That's the, that's the end result. What did Romans chapter 8 say? We were predestinated to be conformed into the image of his son. That's what it's all about. That's the end result of God's salvation and redemption of our lives. Is to make us like his son. And Paul says, hey... Yeah, I look back and I see what God's done in my life. And man, am I grateful. But I'm nowhere to where I want to be yet. I haven't reached the end yet. I'm not like Christ. 
And if I look at my own life, I am so far from that, I can't even hardly see the finish line. We have not reached it yet. We're still striving for that goal. We're still running the race. But how do we run the race? By knowing Christ more and more and more. The power of His resurrection and the sufferings and being conformed unto His death. This justification and the sanctification we have in Christ Jesus. That's how we run the race. That's how we continue. And Paul says, look, then... Boy, that's going to be a day when we reach the finish line. And we receive, look, the Bible says we're going to be glorified together with Him. Now, brother, that's a great thing. I don't, you want to talk about the grace of God, that's the grace of God. For us sinners, rebellious sinners, to be glorified together with the Son of God, that's the power of God and the grace of God in its climax, if you will. Well, we'll finish there. We'll pick this up next week.